We have a koi that we're yeah. releasing on behalf of Michael. Okay, Just good idea. Let the there. fish go. Everybody knows how much Michael loves koi, that he would like to have a koi release. Here, here's the koi. Okay, oh. here he goes. Okay. No. Here we go, beautiful. <laughs> there he goes. Yay. Yay. There he is. They now release the fish, a symbol of life, of course, fertility and everything. So now we've got one or two other little statements to make, mm -hmm. perhaps a poem or two, and then we can go to the reception. And then I hope that people will simply exchange uh, memories of, of Michael and, and, and just uh, be very informal and, and chat at the reception. And we have some videos of Michael. And we ha oh, and we have videos of Michael as well. Okay, well, can we start with, with, with uh, you? My name is Xiao Li. Yeah. And another thing impressed me so much, he treated everybody with a great, great heart. No matter he's a great man, a famous Chinese scholar, or just a Chinese little girl. One day I invited to my house, my friend is a new immigrant. His daughter is about nine years old. And then the little girl says, I like poetry. He said, really? I can mail to you. I don't have enough. Hmm. So I don't have enough book today. So he wrote down the little girl's address. Later, my friend told me he mailed two books. To put a two collection of poems to that little girl, I think this little girl is studying, and it, it will become a movie director. I I think she will remember Michael all her life. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I live next to Michael. Yes. Uh, in 1971, on uh, Kings Road on campus. I had just come from New York. I had come to work in the library here and I had two little boys and uh, these were row houses I don't know uh, you, you may be familiar with Toronto Road Kings Road all of those uh, Balfour parental houses and my wife and I knew absolutely nobody when we came and Michael I didn't know what he was who he was what he did all I knew was that he lived next door to me and uh, when I found out who he was, I was in awe of him. I was about 28 years old at that time, and um, had, I had a master's in, in English from NYU, and uh, I had never known any, any, any real writers before. And I guess what, what, what I wanted to say now is, is, is not so much the professional relationship that I had with him because that wasn't ever so big. It was a personal relationship and how, how really kind he was. Uh, my wife and I were both working and there was nobody here. My boys were four and two years old and M Michael, believe it or not, loved to look after them. I would never have thought that would be the case, but he did uh, babysit for them. And um, my parents used to come out from New York and we had no room for them. Michael opened up his own house. He let them live there for weeks at a time when they came visiting us. So, so, many, so many instances like that, that, that they really, uh, I, I have a difficult time recalling them all. And of course, then, then as a professional, I did some reviewing for him, so, uh, some books that he did. And the books that he wrote kept coming and coming and coming and coming. <laughs> and as soon as I thought I was on top of it, another book came out. <laughs> and, and he autographed them all to me, to us, to my wife and I. So I was obligated to read them. And I must say, I asked him once, I said, Michael, how should I read you? I have two ways to read you. I said, one way is just to let it wash over me, to just to let your poetry, to let your other verses. Another way is to look at every single word as a literary work and, and, and analyze them. He said, don't do that. <laughs> he said, don't do that. You'll never finish what I've written. Never, never. <laughs> Not in a million years. And he was right. And still the books kept coming. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that, that's all I wanted to say, how much I'll miss him. I, I regrettably let him drift away from my life when he left Vancouver. Um, 
we had very little contact, but these memories that I have will be with me. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I first saw Michael driving west, 1968, on University Boulevard. He was peering out over the dashboard <laughs> and through the windscreen of uh, Austin, Cambridge, which was exact match of the car he had in London. And <laughs> this was before class had started, the class that Mike had originated, brought Michael Bullock in from England on a Commonwealth uh, Fellowship to teach. And uh, so that's my image of Michael driving west. Should say, at the end of that year, he went to Hawaii, <laughs> further west. <laughs> um, much, has been, much has been said about Michael as a poet. Much has been said about him as, as a painter. Um, but I think sometimes we miss the fact that we had a very distinguished translator here in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Two small incidents to, to show you the degree of that significance of that translator. I was having a chat with him one day and lamenting the fact that Canada didn't seem to produce very many translations of the great European classics. Canada Council, as you probably know, supports Canadian writers, but doesn't support German writers, doesn't support Austrian writers, doesn't support Chinese writers, mm -hmm. they support Canadian writers. So as a result, we don't have very many translations of the great classics done by Canadians. We have we have them done by all sorts of other people. And so I was, I was lamenting this with Michael, and he said, well, why don't you do one then? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, all right, but where would I get one? And he said, well, I'm the authorized Max Frisch translator. Mm -hmm. Why don't we do some Max Frisch plays? And, and I just about dropped right there in my tracks, because Max Frisch I had remembered reading as a, as a young teenager. And here was, here was the offer of a, of a Max Frisch translation. In fact, we did three of his plays, Michael's, Michael's translations. And this went very well, and, and some years passed, and um, I was you know, thankful to Michael that we had been able to do this. And I was talking to him another time, and I said, you know, my publishing house, we need, really need a big name at the moment. We need someone, someone that can lift up the press, you know, and do you have any suggestions? And he looked at me and he said, well, is Michel Tremblay big enough? And I said, yes, but he's, he's been translated. He's, he's already been done, a Quebecois author. Probably one of the biggest names in Canadian Quebecois literature. And Michael said, well, I just happen to have a translation of his first book in my top drawer. Would you like to do it? <laughs> and I said, Michael, thank you. And so we did the Michel Tremblay as well. And that was a, a French translation. The Max Frisch was German. You know, a very, very distinguished translator here in Vancouver. And uh, I think we owe it to him to, to remember that as well as his poetry and his, and his painting. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, well now I think we should go to the reception and maybe Laurie-Anne and Gus can lead the way. Okay, yeah. well it, it's about a four block walk from here or you can drive over there if you prefer. And it's called the Old Barn Community Center. It's on the corner of Larkin and Thunderbird. Nice to be here yeah. and nice to see you. Yeah. I love what you said. Bridge of Moths. Across 10,000 miles, my thoughts fly to you. A swarm of pastel colored moths to beat against your window panes in the dark. Will you hear them and let them in? Or will you find them in the morning, dead on the sill, sweep them up and throw them away? Whatever happens, they will continue to fly till they form a fluttering rainbow over sea and land, across which I can walk to you and beg for admittance, bearing in my hand a bouquet of dream flowers. <laughs> 